Ah, God, I need a haircut. So, to recap, um, so is there objective morality? That's what this is going to be about. And the last video I asked if there is such thing as objective reality, and my answer to that was yes, and uh, because the line of reasoning was pretty much if there has to be some sort of consensus, you know, whenever you're interacting with a person. Uh, which is circular because in order to even communicate that thought, I have to use the word consensus, which is a word that I subjectively came up with. But then the other person, you know, in order to understand me, they have to also understand the word consensus and the, the language that we're using. Anyway, I don't want to get back into that thing, but yes, there has to be some kind of consensus uh, when talking about what is real, when talking about what's true. So the question here is, is there consensus with morality? Because what I pretty much did was I said, you know, if there has to be some kind of consensus, then we just say that, you know, the consensus that is what is objective, the general consensus amongst, and I, there are some other criteria for who had to agree, but that's basically it. So the question here is, there, always, there also has to be consensus. Uh, now, of course, it's not as simple as there just needs to be consensus because, you know, you can have, uh, you can easily come up with scenarios where, you know, all the people on the planet, for instance, you know, believe that murder is good and there's one person that doesn't and, you know, who's right is, is the question. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to start by sort of defining my term and I don't necessarily mean objective in the sense, in a metaphysical sense, in a Plato's form sense. There is no Plato's form for uh, morality, for ethics. I mean, there's a hypothetical sort of subjective Plato's form, but it's not, it, there's, no thing, there's nothing ontological about it. You know, we have uh, Hume's law, which says we can't derive an ought from an is. So if I'm conversing with you and we agree on reality, we agree on what's true, doesn't mean we're going to agree on morality. And... Uh, Hume's law says that I can't just use reality to prove morality. I can't ever say, well, because the universe is like this, then morality should be like that. Um, what that, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a bit more into detail about Hume's law later, or what that actually comes from. But, uh, like, the idea with this sort of debate is that you, there's always, there's always this, um, there's always two sides. There's like objective versus subjective, and what's objective is usually thought of, of as universal, sort of absolute, um, sort of ontological, hardwired in the universe, and subjective is more relative to human perception and not necessarily uh, something people will agree on, you know, etc. Uh, th the way I see it, though, <clears throat> you know, even if everyone agrees on everything, then that's still technically subjective because it's not ontological, right? It's not the real thing, it's just what we perceive through human lenses. So what I'm referring to as objective is uh, is sort of the Plato's form for humans, is as objective as something can be within consensus. Right, because yes, there's always going to be a sort of a, a an obstacle and a a, a a barrier between us and what is real, what is ontological. That that stuff is always going to be inaccessible. So there's no point in talking about the inaccessible. What we talk about is the stuff that is accessible and the consensus therein. And within the realm of accessibility, that's where the word objective comes into play as sort of a global uh, universal standard for um, you know reality behavior etc the the goal of this whole thing of course is to uh, come up with is to come up with a standard for um, uh, objective an objective standard for artistic quality in within things like music and uh, uh, literature storytelling etc and a lot of people, you know, think, okay, well, that's definitely subjective. What are you talking about? Well, I don't think it's that simple. Uh, in the very least, there's definitely some use in coming up with a, a sort of a, an objective standard. Uh, 
a standard that people should try to adhere to, even if it doesn't necessarily agree with their tastes. I, I don't want to get too much into that, but let's talk about morality. Again, what we're looking for here, what we're looking for is an objective moral standard, i.e. A, a moral standard, What it, all that means is it's a moral standard that we can all agree on. That's all we're looking for. Is a moral standard we can all agree on. So the statement, well, all moral standards are different, and the conversation ends there. No. <laughs> that is very, very boring and... Uh, very boring and very... Uh, sort of non-constructive. If the conversation ends right there, then... Uh, I mean, you, you don't get anywhere. I mean, I think there's there's definitely something more to explore. And, and you can't really argue that there is some use in coming up with sort of an objective standard. And again, what I mean by that is it's not ontologically objective, it's just objective in the sense that it's something we should all agree to. So, the way this works, to find an objective standard, to find a standard that we can all agree to, agree upon, we have to sort of understand where our own personal standards come from, where our own personal subjective standards come from. And, and uh, you know, Stefan Molyneux and, and uh, all these people, you know, a lot of people, I'm just going to say that in generally, a lot of people seem to think that, well, it's all about just being rational and, you know, empirical and, uh, you know, debating and using logic and eventually you'll find the right answer. Now that would work if what we're debating about is objective reality. If we're looking for an objective standard for what's real, then yes, using logic is the only way to do that. When it comes to morality, um, using logic doesn't get you in the same place. I mean, if, if you're having a debate with someone, and um, you could say a debate, well, okay, uh, for instance, let's say we're going to accuse a certain person, uh, call him Jack, of doing something bad, of saying something mean, for instance, to someone else. And I'm saying, well, Jack, you did a bad thing there. You, um, you were rude to this other person. That's, a, uh, that's me, sort of, uh, that, that, that's my ethics in play here. That's me telling Jack that it is unethical to do what he did. And then Jack could say, well, uh, it was okay for me to be mean because you know, that other person's reaction to what I said doesn't matter, right? Now, you know, th there's nothing, th that conversation right there has nothing to do with reasoning or logic or empiricism. It's entirely emotional, right? It is entirely, the only reason I think it was unethical for Jack to do what he did is because, well, let's say I can empathize with being in the shoes of the person he insulted, and I can say, well, I wouldn't want to be in those shoes, therefore, you know, ergo, via empathy, I decide that it's unethical because I wouldn't want that happening to me. Uh, now, Jack, for instance, may lack empathy, and or he may have very good reasons why not to care for this other person, and so he says their feelings don't matter. That also is not rational or empirical or there's no logic to that, right? It's just emotional. My point is, and I don't know if I got it across, but um, ethics is entirely emotion driven. It is fully 100% driven by emotions and instincts and uh, virtues and principles. You know, these aren't things that you can just prove. So, the, the case you know, I said at the, st I talked about Hume's Law right at the beginning, what that actually means is, is a lot, um, it, it's a lot worse than you can't derive morality from reality. What it basically says is, all of morality, all of ethics is totally emotional. It, it is all, like, like, you know, if we're talking about reality, we can, come up with axioms. We can decide, okay, well, we have to concede, you know, we have to agree on laws of logic, we have to agree on science, mathematics, and then we can debate. Once we agree on all that stuff, then we can debate. With morality, it's like none of that stuff matters at all. You're not agreeing on logic, you're agreeing on... It's a different sort of um, 
it's a different realm of debate. You're you're debating emotional instincts. You're debating whether you should have empathy for someone or not, or you're debating whether or not something is good or bad, which honestly, in effect, is debating whether or not you should have empathy for someone or not, or, or whether you would want a certain thing done to you, or whether you'd want to face a certain consequence, etc., etc. It is fully emotional. It draws its logical genesis within human emotions rather than within human, you know, perception of reality. Th that's the difference between the question of objective morality ver versus objective reality. Objective reality, you know, that question draws its genesis in what we perceive about the world. This draws its genesis in what we, the way we feel about things, which is so much, so much more, um, complicated and, and hairy and and sub and honestly relative because of how different people can be so I mean w what does that mean for when we're even having a debate about objective morality let's say that I you know I come to you and I used to think this that I used to think that you can always convince people just by being logical you know I convinced if you could just use reason and logic you can convince anyone you know I when I was younger and uh, I don't think that anymore because I've sort of been able to understand that it's not just their logic that's the issue. It, their logic is a manifestation of their emotions, their personality, right? Their emotional instincts. And there's nothing I can do to change that. You know, you can't change or you, you can't really change a person's emotional instincts, right? So let's imagine for a second that you know let's imagine in under what circumstances would people agree on an objective standard of morality like when I come up here in front of the camera and I say it's important to have empathy who would agree to that who would you know who would listen to that and say yes I agree to that and th that is a correct thing now obviously there's people who have empathy who would agree to that the people who have that capacity would. People who don't have that capacity won't, right? They won't agree. But is it possible for people to have the capacity for empathy and still disagree? Okay, or actually, l let's make it something more, uh, you know, concrete. You know, is it possible for two people to have the same virtues, the same principles, but still disagree on things? Yes, I think there is. I think that is the problem of ignorance. You know, if we have the same virtues and the same principles, but we disagree on something political, like libertarianism, for instance, then that is an example of one of us being more ignorant than the other. Okay, so Stefan Molyneux, for instance, I don't think that, you know, a, a lot of people hate the guy, but, you know, I, I see myself as actually very similar to him. I, I think we have very similar virtues, very similar instincts, but very similar principles, but... He obviously thinks, you know, the state is evil, get rid of it, etc. And I don't because, you know, and, and maybe I'm ignorant or maybe he's ignorant, right? But the point is the difference between the two of us is one of ignorance. It's one of one of us either not knowing something or not understanding something. That's the only reason we disagree. It's, it's uh, you know, and the fact is we probably both of us are actually ignorant and don't know the full truth. Although, one of us is probably closer to the objective standard than the other. Or, in this case, one of us is probably closer to agreeing than the other. Uh, sorry, uh, one of us is probably closer to the objective standard that we should agree to uh, than the other. But what if someone has different principles? You know, what if someone is as intelligent and uh, not ignorant at all, you know, you can still disagree with them. And I know this from experience. I was, you know, I, I, um, I studied physics and math at uh, the University of Toronto. And when I first came to the university, I thought, okay, you know, there's going to be a lot of smart people here. And at the time I thought, okay, smart people, I'm going to find people I can agree with about things. And the truth is I found some people I agreed up uh, you know, about some things, but the vast majority of people, you know, no. The, there's a lot of people that I disagreed with, or rather people that disagreed with me. And so, 
you know, uh, I sort of realized, no, it's not just a matter of ignorance. It's not just a matter of, you know, lacking the ability to reason or, or not uh, understanding certain things. It's, it, it's not even cultural upbringing that's important. I think on some level, there's just some people you cannot convince, right? And Molyneux believes in, um, he doesn't believe in determinism, right? Because he thinks you can convince anyone. But no, I do not believe you can convince anyone. There are some people you will just never be able to convince to, to, to your, uh, your standard because they just can't, because your standard, again, is predicated on your feelings. And that person doesn't have those feelings. And this is why I'm so concerned now with um, narcissists and sociopaths. Like I did a video uh, a few weeks ago about narcissism. Okay, and this is the important thing about narcissists and sociopaths, guys, is that they cannot, they cannot experience feelings of empathy. Okay, they can't have, like there's parts of the brain that are supposed to be, um, there's parts of the brain that are supposed to be responsible for empathy. I mean, they've done brain scans of these people and those, those parts of the brain just don't light up at all uh, when they do for, you know, other people. So, it, you know, a sociopath can be just as smart as you or just as smart as me, but I still can never convince them to have empathy because they just can't experience that emotion, okay? And morality and ethics is, is entirely predicated on stuff like that. It's entirely predicated on us being able to experience the same emotions uh, before we come up with a framework for it. You know, so there's no point in arguing with a sociopath. Now, okay, I will say, though, this is all predicated on the idea that sociopaths and narcissists can't actually change at all. And I don't know if that's entirely true. And it's definitely not true when people are younger. People, you know, when people are younger, they're sort of more malleable, but uh, it's definitely less true when they're older. People are harder to change when they're older. But even then, you know, there's things like therapy and, uh, you know, encouraging people with social disorders to think in new ways. And, you know, those people, the, the, that therapy, I don't know how much change that can do. I would imagine the change is very minimal, but let's just assume for argument's sake that there is no change whatsoever, that a sociopath will always be a sociopath and there's nothing we can do about that. Well, uh, we cannot have a debate with a sociopath, you know, you, or you cannot have a debate with someone who has um, uh, NPD or BPD, you know, th these people have a social disorder that prevents them from experiencing the, the emotion that is required, that the emotion that is upon which the argument itself is contingent, right? Like, we can't talk about empathy or, or love or compassion, any of that stuff, because that very conversation is contingent upon the people in the conversation having the ability to experience that stuff. And sociopaths can experience that stuff, so you don't debate them. So, what this pretty much means is the only people you can debate when it comes to morality is the people who already agree with you or can already agree with you. And uh, so either people who, it, it, it's basically people who already agree with you on everything or people who, you know, uh, should agree with you on everything but are really stupid about some things and therefore don't. You know, people who are very stupid and very deluded. Uh, and, you know, that's a pretty cynical, unfortunate reality, but uh, that's just the thing that I keep you know, uh, that I keep seeing. And debating people is like the only thing I do. So, I mean, I'm just seeing it as uh, sort of the unfortunate thing. So what, what does this mean for, um, what does this mean for objective morality? You know, who decides what an objective standard is, right? Who decides what, you know, what's the objective standard that we ought to stick to? Well, by virtue of the fact that just to have the conversation, the people within the conversation have to agree, uh, have to be able, have to be, have that. Uh, just to have the conversation, the people within the conversation both have to have the capacity to experience the same emotions means that we have to rule out people who are sociopaths and narcs and BPDs and histrionics, etc and, uh, you know, people with social disorders because they can't experience the same emotions. It's probably a good idea to rule out certain, you know, other subsets of people that can't experience certain emotions. Uh, 
until you're left only with people who, you know, they're, they're not, maybe they have some narc traits or some BPD traits, but they don't have any disorder, so you can pretty much get them to experience the same emotions that you do. And if you can get them to experience the same emotions that you do, then ideally you can have the debate with them. And so it's that group of people that gets to decide what the objective standard is, right? It by consensus again. And again, you the people have to be uh, intelligent. They had they can't be ignorant. Uh, so sort of like my answer for what is objective reality? You know, is there objective reality? I'd say the same thing. Objective morality is decided by people who you know aren't stupid, aren't ignorant, and people who. Uh, Number one, aren't stupid, aren't ignorant, and number two, have the capacity to experience the same emotions that you do. So, you know, those are two very serious conditions. Uh, I imagine that most people that really engage themselves in philosophy are, uh, you know, generally um, not ignorant, although there's been exceptions, and engage themselves, I mean study, because there's, I know people who just read philosophy books and, and are, you know, it all goes over their heads. Um, and then people who, you know, care enough about the subject to have a debate. I mean, it's, it's really hard to tell whether someone is capable of experiencing the same emotions that you do, but, you know, once you know a person long enough, you pretty much, you, you, you know whether to rule their opinion out or not. So, you know, I, I keep, uh, you know, b before on this channel, I would, I would hate on Stefan Molyneux a lot, and I've sort of changed my mind. I mean, I still disagree with UPB and all that stuff, and it's still uh, a flawed framework. But I, I find myself sympathizing with the man because I know that he's capable of the same emotions that I am. I know that he's not a sociopath. You know, at best, you know, so at worst, he's just very, very deluded and ignorant, which honestly is a lot better than the alternative. Uh, so that's sort of the the point to be made. And, I mean, I, I, I t sort of to follow the line of reasoning with UPB, but, uh, you know, we have in ethics, we have sort of three categories of standard. We have virtues, and also known as, you know, person's motivations, their intentions, virtues, principles, etc. Uh, the deontological moral value of actions themselves, and then the consequences. Consequentialists care about consequences, you know, and then there's people like Immanuel Kant care about the deontology, and then there's people who care about the intentions. And I said, and I have a huge video where I talk about uh, the morality, you should care about all three, all three are important, but the only one that you can standardize, the only one where, the only one where every single person basically has to be identical is the virtue category, the motivation, intention category. Everyone has to be identical in that category. You know, that is something you have to completely standardize in order to be able to have the debate. You know, people can have varying intelligences, varying, uh, you know, understandings of the world, maybe some people are even deluded, but, you know, within, uh, they have to have very similar virtues, at least, in order to just, in, just to have this discussion, they have to have the same virtues. Um, you can never standardize actions, uh, the deontology, the middle section here, you can't ever standardize consequences because the universe is too chaotic to standardize consequences, it's too complicated to, like, you can never convince, you can never set up a moral framework where the consequences of every action are the same, right? So you can't standardize consequences. You can't standardize uh, the, the middle section either, the deontology. That's what Molyneux is actually trying to do. He, he does that with UPB. He says, you know, murder, always wrong. Theft, always wrong, etc. You know, th that is standardizing it. That's saying that there are certain actions that are always bad, certain actions that are always good. That is what standardizing deontolo you know, the deontological aspect means. I'm saying you can't do that. What you can standardize is virtues. What virtues are always good? Empathy. Always a good virtue. Unless it's too much empathy, maybe. Um... You know, honesty, always a good virtue. Uh, intelligence or, or caring about being intelligent is usually a good virtue, you know, etc. So stuff like that. And the very bad virtues are, you know, selfishness and uh, virtues, 
that are always bad are, yeah, selfishness and, um, uh, sort of sh shallowness and, uh, caring about sort of yourself and your progress and your image, your image, that is a very, very bad one. Now, these are all virtues that are always bad, always, but then there's virtues that are always good. And sort of, that's sort of the debate that I think we need to have is if we're talking about building a, sort of a, um, a perfect moral standard, an objective moral standard is we talk about virtues, is we talk about what are bad virtues, what are good virtues. And, um, <laughs> and we will agree on what are bad and good virtues because we are capable of agreeing. But the only people who won't agree are the people who are sociopaths and narcs, right? Like, like what person, you know, on the planet would, could possibly say that having empathy is a bad thing? You know, either that they are a sociopath <laughs> or a narc and they don't think empathy is good or valuable, or they're lying, uh... Or, or, sorry, they're a good person, but they're lying for some reason. Or they're someone who does have empathy, but they're deluded. And in either case, it's all... Hip if someone has empathy and they say that empathy is bad, then they are literally just being hypocrites. Because if you have empathy, you can't not have empathy, right? It's... it's you can't not react in an empathetic way. So, I mean, I don't know if that made sense. But the point is, you know, if we're talking about setting an objective standard for morality, we need to talk about what are the best virtues. At least that's the place to start. Then we can talk about what are the best actions, and then we can talk about what are the best consequences. But we'd start with virtues, we'd start with intentions. And uh, I think that if you do that, and if you do that with people who have the capacity of agreeing, then, um, and we're all sort of rational and reasonable and not stupid, then eventually we will agree on a model or a framework that's very similar to the, uh, the morality equation model that I had, uh, that I posted like a few months ago. Granted, that was a very sort of rough, you know, rudimentary, uh, explanation of that, but the skeleton of the idea was there. So, the, I guess the only one question that you might ask is, why do we need an objective standard, okay? Why do we need an objective standard? Because I'm sure there's people who probably have the same virtues that I do that would hear me say, um, we need an objective standard, and they'd say, well, why? You know, why should anything be objective? Why should morality be objective? That's a good question, and I think to, in order to answer, <laughs> I think to believe that morality I think that's sort of an axiom, honestly. That's not something you can really justify. I think in order to um, in order to understand why morale you need you need an objective morality, I think you need to believe that you need an objective morality, right? Like if you understood why we needed an objective morality, you would have an objective morality already. So it's not something I can necessarily convince a person with just by trying to answer it, but the way I see it is if what we're trying to do with morality is construct a utopia, construct a world where people are content, where people are happy, where people, where, where, peop, where happiness is maximized, where well-being is as maximized for everyone as it could be, then the only way to do that is to try and reach an objective morality. Uh, there is that that would be my only real argument for that is that you cannot do this you cannot have a world without suffering um if people without having uh, without standardizing morals right i mean think, look at the legal system right like why is murder you know uh outlawed because if murder was legal if murder was something you know people could just do whenever they wanted i mean uh, you wouldn't have a utopia right? There's a reason that it's punished, right? So the reason it's punished is basically be because everyone agrees that murder is wrong. You know, that is an objective standard. That is, an, that is a standard that everyone agrees. And that's the reason UPB has so much weight is because it says that here's these, you know, universally preferable behaviors that we should just follow. I mean, I would say, again, my problem with UPB isn't that it tries to universalize ethics. My problem with it is that it doesn't do a good enough job of it. You know, it doesn't universalize enough 
preferable behaviors. Uh, it doesn't talk about virtues. It doesn't talk about, you know, what people's intentions ought to be rather than, you know, what it only talks about actions. And that's the, the biggest flaw within that framework. But, you know, to answer the question, why do we need an objective standard? It's because, well, without an objective standard, you're going to be unhappy or someone else is going to be unhappy. Somebody maybe that you care about will be unhappy. There's going to be unhappiness everywhere. And the only way to fix that is to have an objective standard. Now, granted, whenever you'd say this, uh, a lot of people immediately start getting sort of suspicious and say, well, what you're saying sounds sort of like a cult and any kind of paradise or utopia that you build out of this cult will be one where everyone is identical. And I don't think that's true at all. You know, it wouldn't be a society of people that are identical. It would be a society of people that are similar and that they have similar, you know, standards, but they are still, you know, varyingly different in their own way. And there's still individuality. There can still be sort of uh, creativity. There can still be, you know, nuances and different kinds of people and different kinds of experiences. But their moralities, their principles have to be the same. They have to be the same. And, uh, you know, the only place in fiction that I can easily think of where I've seen something like this is the Star Trek universe. You know, the, the society that they have in Star Trek, uh, the next generation, for instance, you know, the, the, the way, the attitude, the culture that those people have is very highly indicative of one where people are always empathetic, people are always you know, sort of honest and virtuous, and they have all the right intentions and the right qualities. They're still different, though, right? It's not a society of clones or, you know, uh, you know people who are just completely, you know, drones. But, uh, so, so, I mean, what I would say to that is that's sort of the, that's sort of the opposite extreme. In trying to standardize morality, you have to be careful not to go too far and standardize all human behavior to the point where everyone is the exact same person and society becomes very fucking uh, a very boring hive mind uh, you know collective but we definitely need to be brought closer to that uh, point and that would be the answer uh, is there objective morality and so for the next video I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that yes the answer is their objective morality is yes and that the answer is that the one I gave, uh, because that is what, again, the, the, the goal of this whole thing is to figure out whether there's such thing as objective quality in art. And if we agree that there's objective reality and that there's objective morality, then I would say that it does follow that there is objective quality in art. But again, so take that for what you will. Uh, and by all means, uh, I don't actually, I'm not totally proud of this video now that I think about it. I didn't, I wasn't um, totally uh, organized as I want to be. But if you enjoyed it, and if you have something to say, comment by all means. Cheers. <laughs>